Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's UX Crunch. Uh, this is UX Crunch at home, and tonight we'll be exploring defining a user-centered culture. Um, this is a slightly different format for tonight's event, uh, where we will be first welcoming jo uh, Josh Lamar, who's CEO and co-founder of Authentic Authentic UX, who's going to be delivering a talk uh, on this topic. Uh, and then we'll be following up with an extended panel discussion led by Paola Miani, uh, who's design culture lead over at Lloyd's Banking Group. Uh, and we'll be welcoming a few additional panelists in Genevieve Bajan, who's principal user researcher at Sainsbury's, and Eric Smallwood, who is UX lead at Somo Global. Um, before we get started, we are Tech Circus. We're a networking events company based out of London, uh, where it is currently very cold. So please do excuse my hat and jumper. Uh, my heating's broken, so I'm waiting for our engineer to arrive uh, and so trying to keep warm in the process. But uh, really glad to welcome you all this evening. Um, so Tech Circus, we run networking events uh, online since the pandemic started. Previously, we were in physical events running in London, Manchester, Amsterdam and Berlin, and a range of conferences both in the UK and uh, North America too. Um, since the move online, all of our events are free as part of our TechCircusTV.com community. Uh, this is a free membership where you can watch uh, regular events from us, from our community, uh, and network with your peers. If you want to learn a bit more about Tech Circus, follow what we're doing, or if there's any specific aspect of tonight's event you really want to talk about on your social media, why not uh, follow us on our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn using at Tech Circus, uh, with Twitter and Instagram having an underscore after. Uh, and then, uh, as you see at the bottom, uh, there is a hashtag for tonight's event and all of our UX Crunch events, and it's simply hashtag UX Crunch. So please do follow us. Please do tweet about us, uh, hashtag us. And uh, yeah, and, and, and make sure you mention our speakers as well uh, who are bringing this awesome content to us this evening. Um, <clears throat> before I get into the agenda for tonight, I'll leave that there for you to look at in the meantime. But I did want to uh, just give you a quick overview of the functionality of the Big Market platform this evening. Um, whilst we do have a, an action-packed set of content for you this evening, um, there will be time in this extended uh, Q&A for you to engage uh, through the discussion as well. Uh, and that's all going to happen in this poll, uh, in this panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So um, if you can't see it, it might be a small little, what looks like a chat bot down in the corner. If you click that, it'll pop up and it should say chat, Q&A, polls, handouts. And you'll see that under uh, chat, there's a general chat where um, a few of you, well, myself and uh, Miroslav, have already uh, outlined who you are, where you're from uh, this evening. So if anyone else wants to kind of jump on that way, please do my get, please be my guest. But there are also a number of other rooms for some of our partners uh, for tonight's event, as well as one for sharing your LinkedIn so you can connect with other people at this event and also a share useful resources section as well where you can share additional uh, resources to help your peers um, in their development, or either around this topic or e perhaps something about remote working, anything like that, but we'd love to hear more. Um, and you'll see Josh and Eric, thank you very much for saying hi to Miroslav. Uh, and Miroslav, thanks for being our uh, lone audience member who is up for jumping in and getting involved in these activities. Um, so on next to chat, there is a Q&A tab. Now, whilst Paola will have a lot of questions for our panelists this evening, uh, it, it's really important for us that you get involved too, and we'd love to hear your questions too. And we do that through this Q&A tab. I'm just going to put out an example question. You'll see it just says question. And what I'd like you to do is just hit that thumbs up if you really like that question from any other audience member, or if you have your own questions, please do ask them here. And then the most voted questions will be the ones that we tend to kind of gravitate towards when engaging in our discussion. The next section over is polls. Now, whilst you can ask your questions to our audience, uh, to our speakers, we, our speakers might have some polls as well throughout this event through which they'd love to engage with you and learn a bit more about you too. So please, um, if, if that, uh, if, yeah, please do get involved uh, as and when. And then lastly is our handouts section where there is already a PDF in there about additional resources on user-centered design. So um, please do, uh, if you are interested in, uh, you know, continuing your learning beyond this event, please do check it out there. So tonight's agenda, as I outlined, Josh Lamar will be speaking at 6.10, uh, well, 
just gone. Uh, and then we'll have uh, uh, an extended panel discussion where we'd love for you to get involved, followed um, by uh, the live Q&A. The live Q&A panel is part of that same panel. So it's part, it's, it's all together. So um, we have a few partners who make our events a possibility uh, to host online and, and bring you that for as a free resource. Uh, and first of all, I wanted to say thank you to uh, Adobe XD, who have been partnering with us on the US Crunch basically since we came into the virtual space. Uh, and tonight they do have a, a competition running. So you can win a year's subscription if you answer this question from Adobe XD, define user-centered design. So um, you could, is it either iteration of design solutions, validating uh, validation of testing with users, multidisciplinary design, or all of the above? Uh, and if you uh, answer correctly, you'll be put into a competition and we will pick a winner to, um, to win uh, a year's subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud. Next up, um, we have um, Zebra People. So they specialize in digital recruitment, so bringing together the smartest digital talent with the best loved brands, leading agencies, and innovative startups. And tonight they've got a um, salary guide to help any of you who are out there currently looking at your uh, perhaps your next role, the new year very, very fast approaching. Uh, so please check out your salary guide, the salary guide and where you um, where you sit within the industry. Uh, and then they're also available this evening um, in the networking room, which I flagged earlier, just which is under the chat section in that interactive bar on the right. Um, and then lastly, uh, our last partner for this evening is Sherpa. And Sherpa are a um, UX design studio. So they're founded out of Istanbul uh, and currently operating in London and Istanbul, focused on creating unique user and customer experiences. And um, we are going to do another quick pop out for um, Sherpa's audit. Uh, where they have an offer for anyone joining this evening. Um, let me just pop that up. There you go. Uh, so if you are interested, they've got a 20% off code for anyone here from the Tech Circus community who's interested in exploring that. So do hit that pop up and go and check that out. There is also uh, a chat function, a, a chat room here in our chat functionality where you can jump in and speak to those too. So without any further ado, I would love to welcome um, Josh Lamar to please turn on his webcam. Uh, and meanwhile, we'll get your slides ready. Hey, Josh, uh, how are you doing? I can see you. Uh, can we hear you? Just do you want to say hello and where you're joining from this evening? Hello, hello. I am joining from Paris, France. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can. Um, it's very slightly on the quieter side. I wonder if you might be able to turn it up slightly, if it's possible. Otherwise, audience, Turn your volume right way up. Is that better? Yeah, that is actually better. So perfect. Okay. Um, Great. I'm just going to get your slides up quickly. Just loading those now. And uh, Josh, why don't you talk us through very uh, whilst they load? Tell us a little bit, a little bit about um, what it is you're going to be sharing in terms of user centered culture this evening. Yeah, so uh, my journey with user-centered culture has uh, been over the past almost 20 years or so. And so a little bit of this kind of a history lesson of things that have uh, happened in the past 20 years, so the, the shift that has taken place that has created this experience where we are so much more user-centered now than we used to be, but also a discussion around the elements of culture and how we can actually promote being more user-centered in our cultures of design. Amazing. Really excited for that. Um, and then you'll also be joining us on the panel afterwards. Um, yes. I'm just um, trying to get your slides up, but the platform is not having it. So <laughs> give me one second. Um, I've got Karat, my, my teammate, who's team member who's on the back end and is just trying to get that sorted for us as well. Um, <clears throat> but I think you actually, I don't know if you wanted to maybe go live with your poll uh, yeah, let's start with the poll. Now, so we could we could we could go live with your poll, and and Josh wanted to ask um, to get a bit of a flavour who's here today. Oh, there's there comes your deck. Around what Excellent. discipline are you in? So, Josh, I'm going to launch that. I'm going to turn off my cam, turn off my mic, and and away we go. Sounds good. So yeah, go ahead and uh, click on the poll. Oh look, I got the poll too. I'm going <laughs> to click on research because that's what I, where I came from. Uh, but yeah, I'm really interested to hear uh, which discipline or background that you all are coming from, because I think that 
part of uh, a big part of actually what I what I want to talk about today is how all of our disciplines can work together. And I hope that uh, we have a nice mix of people because it'll it'll give some interesting uh, discussion points. So let's uh, click over there and see what we have. I see some percentages where 50% research, 42% design. Hopefully, we'll get some more some more other people um, in there. So I wanted to start off with an idea of culture and what is culture because it's uh, kind of a weird word and it's something that I didn't necessarily know what it was at first. I'm gonna posit that culture is a set of values that we agree upon to uphold that define how we work together and how we make product decisions. And I think that this starts to get at the idea of culture being how we actually make decisions for our target users, for our customers in the product. Another uh, famous person, Biz Stone, who's the co-founder of Twitter, said that positive culture comes from being mindful and respecting your coworkers and being empathetic. And these are things that I think also get really close to the heart of where I'm coming from. Because if you start off by thinking, what is culture in the first place? And how is this even meaningful? Have you been frustrated when you saw some glaring user experience error in a product and just wonder like, how did that happen? How did, how did, this, how did this decision get made? And what does culture have to do with it? And actually it has a lot to do with it because the culture that you have in your company is affects the product that you build. But the thing about culture is that you don't necessarily realize when you're in a good one because things just work. And when you're in a bad one, I think you know pretty quickly, oh yeah, this is this is not a good culture or this is not a good user-centered culture. But right now we're at the place where uh, all Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook all have very user-centered values and mission statements. Of the Amazon leadership principles, customer obsession is the very first one. Google has the 10 things that we know to be true, focus on the user and all else will follow. And then the mission statements of Microsoft and Facebook both have very user-centered ways of, of looking at the world in, in terms of what they, they stand for. The business world has really been driving towards this user-centered culture for the past 20 years, but it hasn't always been this good. It hasn't always been this good for UX people in general, uh, because if we go back on a little history lesson, which we're going to start now, uh, it, it, we came from a, a different place. So I'll, I'll let's talk about uh, three fundamental shifts in product design. So the first shift is from going from the waterfall development to agile development and really the rise of collaborative work. There was a manifesto for agile development in 2001. And it's the first principle says, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. That could have been written today. And this was, this was 2001 and as soon as the development life cycle, and if, if you're not familiar with waterfall as a development methodology, the idea is that you design something and then you build something, then you test something. And it was very kind of like, kick it over the can, like, hey, yeah, I'm done, now it's your turn. And the culture at Microsoft was uh, aligned with, with that as well at the time. Uh, so my, I started at Microsoft at the end of 2003. I know I'm old. and. At the time, it was the uh, just after this this conference this uh, conference where they they created this uh, manifesto for agile software development, and it was still very much so in the in the waterfall section. And even the review process at Microsoft was in such a way that it just it really didn't align with doing things collaboratively and collaboratively working. Um, I don't know if you've seen this particular graphic before. I mean, uh, it's fun because it's just, you can tell a lot about culture from the way that uh, people think about how their organizational hierarchies or org structures are. Uh, but specifically, I'm looking at this one in the middle right, which is Microsoft, where I worked for over 12 years. And you can see the, the, the guns kind of going at each other. And that, that was the mentality at the time because there was one org and we knew better than this other org. So we're gonna 
fight with you to do this. And the review process also really contributed to this kind of negative culture of uh, individualism and uh, my thing is better than your thing and I did this. And then over time, it was really after Satya started that the the review process internally at, at Microsoft actually started rewarding people for contributing to the success of others. And all of a sudden, collaborative working became much better. So as the, the shift from development started going from waterfall into this agile system where all of a sudden everyone is a part of the process and you have these design sprints and then you have coding sprints and then you test and you learn and you iterate and you grow. And it works really, really well with a very user-centered culture, but the culture of the company has to align. And this is an example of the company culture not aligning with a user-centered culture. But as soon as that was fixed, then suddenly it was much easier for people to start working together because they were actually incentivized to work together and to help other people out. The next big shift, oh, I think I already read this one here. <laughs> the next big shift is the shift from big data to the end into big data and the democratization of the user. So maybe you are familiar with the time before data science, but when I started at Microsoft back in 2003, data science wasn't a discipline. In fact, it had just been coined in 2001 uh, as a term, but really the big explosion of data science, I think happened around 2010. And uh, just so you know, in the handout section, I have uh, another version of this presentation, which you can also have access to, but it has a lot of the links to references uh, that I'll be talking about. So after the explosion and integration of data science as a discipline, suddenly the user became democratized. And what I mean by that is all of a sudden, researchers and designers weren't the only people that had access to understanding who the user was. And so if you're defining who the user is and how you know about that person that you're designing for, all of a sudden, if you're a data scientist, you have access to a lot of data and you have a lot of data that you can that you can understand and measure how, ma how many people there are using your product, how long they're, they're using your product, what they're clicking on when they're using your product. And uh, you may also have access to uh, data from like user voice or any kind of uh, feedback system where if you say, hey, I have a comment about this or this is broken or uh, maybe you're a market researcher and you did a survey with a large sample size and you're asking about how people would rate a feature, things like that. The, the realm of what we know to understand who the user is became democratized across all of the different disciplines because all of a sudden everyone is able to have access to learning something and knowing something to be true about who the user is. Maybe you've seen this before where we, we break up qualitative and quantitative research uh, from goals and attitudes of what people say versus behaviors and what people do. And this is really aligned with what's going on in terms of the democratization of the user, because all of a sudden the realm that was kind of research or design or UX uh, became shared with PMs and marketing people and data scientists. And we're all looking at who is this user, but in different ways. And a lot of times what happens is that whenever we're, we have uh, a discrepancy around what people think to be true. It's because they're they're making these distinctions between qualitative insights and quantitative insights, um, and and judging one by the the other. And the third shift I wanted to talk about was really just the rise of user centered design and what I'm going to call negotiated product truth. Uh, I'll explain that more in a minute. But the, the idea that User-centered design is also a thing that has really grown up in the past 20 years. Uh, just another, another date for you, 1998 was the publication of The Inmates Are Running the Asylum by Alan Cooper. And if you're not familiar with Alan Cooper, he was actually a old timer at Microsoft. He designed and created Visual Basic, but now has a UX agency in San Francisco called Cooper. Um, but he wrote this book, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And this is, 
I think one of the first books that talks about the importance of developers not designing because what was happening at Microsoft at the time was that developers were designing the software for themselves. And this was the book that said, hey, let's actually think about who the target user is. Let's create a persona. This is one of the first uses of personas. Um, let's create a persona to figure out who these people are and start designing for them. And this is a, a huge shift in understanding who the person is as a reason and to design something differently. Of course, this is now like, oh yeah, of course you do this. Uh, but at the time, this was this was pretty new. Um, also in 2013, there was a Forrester report. The link again is in the handout section um, on competitive strategy in the age of the customer. And this is where it started this idea of customer obsession, which at least at Microsoft was really, really big. But you can see it, it trickles into all of, uh, all of the other companies now where this idea of if you're obsessed with your customer, you're gonna solve their problems. And when everyone's trying to solve their problems, we get to the space of negotiated project truth. So maybe you've seen this pyramid before. Sometimes it's referred to as the BXT or the business experience and technology. Um, but it's essentially this idea that you have your business needs, which are make money uh, or things that people will buy. And then you have your technological constraints, which are the things that you can buy, that you can develop uh, easily, usually. And then you have user needs, which are the things that the that your customers or your target users need your product to be able to do for them to for it to solve a need that they have for a problem that they have. So if it solves a problem that people have, and it's easy to build, and you can make money on it, all of a sudden, this is probably a product that's going to get built. And then this negotiation zone is kind of in the middle because essentially everything that you build with your product is going to have to be balanced out or negotiated across these three main factors, which requires us all to think in a much more holistic way about the product. And we're now in a place where if you don't understand the business needs of the, the company that you're working at, even as a researcher, I, I mean, I used to think that this was something that was just for other people to think about. And my job is only to think about who the users were and what they needed. But really, the success of a researcher or a designer is going to be really closely tied to building something that will make money and building something in a way that is going to work for the, the technology team that's building it. So this model is kind of self-regulating. Um, and it's because if, if something is unsuccessful, it's usually because there's a breakdown in one of these areas. Like there was one product that I worked on back in 2010. Um, I was working at Bing at the time. And they built this feature. And, and what was amazing about this feature is that it was like not based on a user need at all. It was 100% business need driven. And it was easy to build. And it was a business need. They're like, oh, we need to make more money. So how are we going to do that? And you know, the, I started doing research on it. And people were like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. And what's amazing about this, this experience, though, working on this product was that it got canceled, number one. Uh, you're welcome. And number two, the way that we started thinking about who that user was and designing and iterating based on the user needs. And so it was really, the I think, one of the first big places where I, I started to really understand how important it was to bring all of the disciplines together to each evaluate the experience from the way that that they think about the experience. It ends up that problems with your product stem from products problems that are in your culture. I'll say that again. The problems that you have in your product are stemming from problems that are in your culture. And that's because when you have a breakdown in communication or you have any kind of breakdown between disciplines where they're infighting with each other or just trying to get their political agendas taken care of, all of a sudden you're not focused on the user anymore. You're, you're focused on yourself. You're focused on your career or your discipline and not focused on actually solving the problems that people have. And this is totally evident in, in products and when you see the breakdowns where you're like, oh, how did that happen? Well, it's because of the pyramid and one of those won out, usually the, the business one. Uh, so let's talk about, switch gears a little bit and now start talking about some strategies for building a user-centered product. And building the user-centered product is inherently part of having a user-centered culture.
So the first area is really to adopt user-centered values. And I have a, a slide at the end of this presentation uh, with these listed out, but I'll, I'll read out some of them now. Trust and respect for your colleagues. This is like the number one place to start because if you don't trust each other, if you don't respect that the other person knows what they're talking about, knows their discipline well, understands their uh, their data set in the in the way that is makes the most sense, then you're not really going to be able to negotiate that product truth together. You have to start with the trust and respect of your colleagues. And that leads to deeper collaboration and teamwork on how you can possibly work together. Product responsibility. Each person is responsible for having a product that is going to be user users focused and solves their problems. Empathy for your customers creativity in designing new solutions, collaborative meaning making, compromise, and humility and openness to being wrong. These are values that I've seen in cultures that were very user-centered. And these are things that I think can really help foster a, a culture of focusing on solving user problems or user-centered culture. So the next step is to define a user-centered goal and then agree on how you're going to evaluate success. Each goal should really be unique to the discipline that it comes from. So you're gonna have an overarching goal, which is like, you know, ship this product or build a good product that's gonna be user-focused, but then within the discipline, so engineering is gonna have a different goal than design, which will have a different goal than research and PMs and marketing. But they should all align if they, they work up, uh, bubble up to the, the Uber goal of building a, a product that solves users' problems, then it should all align pretty easily. And there are a lot of different ways that you can actually um, bring these goal setting together. Uh, maybe you're familiar with OKRs or objective and key results. Another one is the heart framework, which you have uh, here. And these are just two different ways of looking at goal setting and measurement. And really when you're looking at what the goal is, you have to be looking at how you measure what success looks like. And even this heart framework here, I just uh, circled them here, there's engagement, adoption, and retention. These are all data science metrics. Engagement, we want people to use the thing we're building. Adoption, we want new people to use it. Retention, we want people to use it again and again. Research can look at happiness and task success and task success is pretty squarely in the, in the realm of usability. But then happiness, even happiness is something that is negotiated between research and marketing. And so what ends up happening, if you take this, uh, this framework from earlier, and then you just realign these different areas, you end up with this system where you have happiness and looking at utility and desirability and task success and usability, firmly in the realm of UX, but then you have happiness is, again, usually PM and marketing are looking at, at happiness and sentiment analysis in user feedback or data science, looking at engagement, adoption and retention. This isn't an exhaustive list, but it's certainly one that starts to build out how all of the disciplines can start working together in order to understand what the truth is for the user and what the product should be and how that product can actually be better. So the third strategy is to build a process that incorporates understanding and testing with your target users. Essentially, the idea is that the process actually reflects the disciplines. And so you build into the process and from a research standpoint, you make sure that you understand when key decisions are being made so that you can inform those decisions at the right timing. And on the UX side of things, you really want to make sure that you're ahead of the process, as ahead of the process as you can get. And if you're lucky enough to have a planning cycle, that that happens sometimes in my career, uh, and not always. I remember one time I actually had a three-month planning cycle for a whole series of of studies that I ran, and that was amazing because we had a really clear idea of what to do next, and we involved target users and testing and understanding with them the whole way. If you can get senior leadership buy-in into this process, that's really gonna help. 
And sometimes if you're gonna about to ship something and you have a go, no go decision, getting a vote in that decision is really important too. Because when everyone has a responsibility for shipping a product that is good, that people wanna use, that solves their problems in a delightful, easy to use way, everyone's gonna get behind that. And it's important that every single person is able to really do everything that they can in order to build that product because it comes from this customer empathy of really focusing on, on solving the user's problems. Next is to participate in gathering data, brainstorming and testing ideas together. And this is the part where if you have a, a bad team culture or people don't get along or don't respect or trust each other, this becomes much more difficult. But when you're actually a part of the process of gathering the data, then it actually can really help because you have, you're creating a shared experience of the team that's building the product for the user. I'm gonna give an example of this in just a moment um, because the last step just aligns really well with where we're going here, this idea of collaborative meaning making because each person is going to be a part of the process of understanding the user, participating in the research itself. They're all gonna have their own understanding of what is true and what, the, what it means for the product, especially based in, on what it means for their discipline. And as you create that meaning together for what it means for the product and how uh, to make that product better for your customers, you're collaborating on the meaning making itself. And then you're refining your process and iterating. And you can really spend uh, the process of building a user-centered culture. You can use user-centered design to make the process itself better because you're gonna learn and then you're gonna grow and you're gonna iterate. And then you're going to be able to do it again. So I want to share a quick case study of what I made to call research speed dating. Uh, I call it research speed dating because Actually, we just used to call it speed dating. And some of the members on the team had it speed dating on their calendar. And their friends were like, you're married. Why are you going to speed dating? And so we, we had to like, oh, yeah, let's actually do this as research speed dating. So research speed dating is a, a, a thing that evolved over time that I created this, this method of doing research very quickly. But the thing is, is that each group, so we had five groups, uh, two hour sessions, five end users or five target customers all come into the lab. And the lab was broken up in such a way that we had room for five different uh, groups. And it actually, we've, we've tweaked with the time and the number of groups and five 20 minute sessions is actually the ideal. Um, I could actually do a whole nother talk on exactly how to do research speed dating at some point too. Um, but the idea is that you have 20 minutes with one user and then after those 20 minutes, all of the, the end users will actually switch groups. And so uh, you end up talking to five different people over the course of two hours. And then if you do two sessions in a day, that's 10 people in one day, but for 20 minutes each. But the thing is, is that 20 minutes is actually a brilliant amount of time because it's just enough to get the answer to one question and learn just enough to take that next step forward. And I actually ran a training for PMs and designers and engineers on how to talk to users. And what we would do, the research team would each uh, consult with each of the different groups, and then the product teams would actually be conducting this research. So we had groups of design, PM, and engineering. Maybe there's a researcher, maybe there are two designers, maybe there's someone from marketing. But typically it was, uh, at least for us, it was a PM design and engineering as a trio. Uh, with maybe one or two other people, but they would interview the user on whatever it was uh, that they were building during that session. And so we would help uh, on the research side, we would help them craft their 20 minute session and how to run it and what, how to ask the questions. And you know what? This is not a thing. This is again, this is going back to the idea of the democratization of the user, because this is not something that that only researchers can do. It's actually something that everyone can do. And you can learn how to not ask a leading question. That's probably the most important thing. It's not tell me how amazing my idea is. It's tell me more about what you think about this. And so this actually became one of the favorite, it changed the way that we did research when I was at Outlook. I was um, the research manager for Outlook uh, for several years. And this actually changed the way that we did research for the whole of Outlook. And all of a sudden, we would be coming together to conduct this research together 
And then we would do it over the course of the day so that at the end of the day, I actually forced everyone to write up their findings in a five slide presentation, like PowerPoint presentation, and then present their findings to everybody else that had been the other groups that were there. And what happened is that everyone learned so much about all of the different people that were there. They learned about their product. They learned about how to make their product better. They learned exactly what they needed to do next. And interestingly, it also was a really wonderful team building because these were people that were in different parts of the Outlook org that didn't normally talk to each other or work together. I know this sounds crazy, but uh, like most big companies, like there was one group that did the mobile app. There's another group that did the website. There's another group that did the, the desktop app. There's So these, these people didn't always talk to each other, but all of a sudden we started sharing information and sharing what we learned about the users and how, what decisions we were making. This became something that we did twice a month, actually, um, and we did it monthly. So this was a really unique way of just fostering this culture. And then at the end, we would just present to each other and had happy hours. I'm a big fan of bringing alcohol in to make make people uh, want to share things together. So it worked really, really well. So before we close out, I just want you all to close your eyes for a minute. And don't worry, this isn't going to get too weird. But I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to do a short visualization exercise because I want you to think about the type of user-centered culture that you want to have. What does that culture feel like to you? What is your role in that culture? And how does your discipline uniquely qualify you to help understand your users? What about the other roles, the other members of your team? How can you help support them to contribute to this discussion of meaning making about understanding your customers? How could you make decisions that are user-centered in a different way? You can open your eyes now. Creating and fostering a user-centered culture isn't only about being user-centered. Being user-centered is a necessary thing, but it's about being team-centered in your quest to solve the needs of your customers. And the really good news about all of this is that you are the person that has the most control over your team culture because it's how you interact with each other. It's how you disagree. It's how you respect and understand each other. And it's about how you negotiate what that product truth is. User-centered culture starts with you. So I want you all to go out and start creating that culture that you want to have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Sorry, it took me a moment to get on there. Um, uh, so yeah, re really loved that presentation. Um, I love the you. kind of step by step, and uh, uh, and I think maybe you could even to try exploring kind of the the research uh, methodology that, that you, you you posited uh, with my own team, like having a, I think it's it's quite an interesting one in that regard. Um, so really excited um, uh, to hopefully get some questions from our audience. I think people have been a bit shy uh, during the first half of the event. So <laughs> if you do have any questions for Josh um, and indeed for our panel, which is coming up uh, very shortly, please do pop them in the Q&A uh, at the end. Um, but uh, oh Josh, I've just seen in the actual chat that Genevieve has a question. So um, did you encounter any resistance to implementing the speed dating? Uh, how open were Outlook to this process? It's, it's a great question. Um, and the answer is that I did it kind of like slightly under the radar at first because it wasn't like, a, we're going to do this now. It actually started out, I was, um, we had a group of interns. They were kind of actually like pre-interns. Um, in a special program to uh, participate in in uh, working at Microsoft for a summer, like an like an internship program, but they were like younger than normal intern age. So they were like just out of high school or uh, just after their freshman year, like they're really young. And I was teaching them about how to do research in the process of user-centered design. And I came up with this idea of actually just bringing in other interns so that they could interview the interns 
about whatever it was that they were building because part of their project was to like build something. And I just got some other interns like, hey, can you come help us out? And I had this idea of like, okay, like let's just, you know, ring a timer after 10 minutes and see what happens and you know, switch and it worked so well and everyone was like this is the most fun I've ever had doing research and I was like hmm this is important something something is uh, something is working here so then I started it really slow like small uh just with one team and you know we iterated on the process I think many many times I think we had and we did it like I mean more than by the end of by the end of when we did it, I mean we were doing twice a month for over a year. Like I mean, it was we had lots of of time to iterate, and we, we just honed in on twenty minutes, five groups, and then you knock on the door at two minutes. So at eighteen minutes, you knock on the door, and that's your two minute warning. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, what happened was because people were learning so much, and we made them document the findings. They and they were also tying them to product decisions. So it was really easy to show this is, you know, what decisions that were made based on doing this research. So we proved the value and it was like one day instead of like, you know, a month putting together a larger study. Yeah. And I, amazing what, what a, a bit of sort of fun as well can, can do to, to a situation, right? <laughs> yeah. Fun is definitely one of the most important things. And, and research is fun mm. and talking to people is fun. Yeah. Amazing. Um, we actually, something's popping up in the Q&A uh, as well. Um, Genevieve says, thanks for that answer. Um, and um, and then Penvista uh, asks, how do you facilitate the initial reflection for an engineering driven culture to really ask, well, are we user centered or do we just say we are? It's a great question. Um, I think that the initial reflection starts from yourself and the places that you have control over. And I think that if you start going too far down the path of I'm user centered, so you have to be, then it doesn't exactly, that's not gonna work. Um, I think that the approach is really more about how can we have a goal and the goal is whatever that goal is, but then how can we turn that goal into something that's user centered? How can we reframe the goals into being something that is going to solve the problems for a real person so that people will use it so that we can make money. And so I think that it, it, it's kind of like there's a little bit of reframing around how, how you what the goal is, but then also an agreement on this is how I measure what is product truth. This is how I measure what good is. Mm -hmm. I actually had another slide in another version of this deck, an older version where I thought about like, okay, well, what is good? From the perspective of a researcher, it's probably that it's easy to use, people can figure it out and it's efficient. Like that would be good for a researcher, but uh, maybe for another discipline, what is good might be different. Like it could be, um, it makes money. So if you're a business person, the product is good if it makes the company money or the product is good if you're a marketing person, it's good if it, is easy to distinguish from the competition so that people will want to buy it. Uh, maybe if you really like the idea of having beautiful software, then it's good if it's beautiful and it's functional. And you can see how each discipline has their own little lens on how to evaluate the product. That's an awesome answer. Thank you, Josh. And um, Thank you. We have time for, for one more question before we jump into this panel. Uh, so, and it comes from Miroslav who asks, uh, who, who mentions, you, you know, you showed a, a beautiful pyramid. Can you share your experience of trying understanding, trying to understand or, or understanding business goals and aligning those in the research process? Yeah, it really started with the idea of, and, and for me, I had a lot of early resistance to this idea, but now being a business owner, it all clicked and made sense because if you don't build a product that people are going to use, the product is going to fail. And if the company that you work for fails, you don't have a job. <laughs> so there's that. But then there's also the, like, these are the business goals for the quarter. And at least at Microsoft, we were always invited to play. There was a, a company meeting. And then we had these big all hands meetings for like the entire office org. I mean, there were like hundreds and hundreds of people at these meetings. And they would be talking about what the, the goal is. And over time, I started realizing that the people that have the power, the people that have the control are the ones that are setting these 
goals. And they're typically features that, that they're going to be building. And so it's it started becoming, OK, how can I influence the features that they're building? And how can I get ahead of that so that we have enough research to support building the things that people really need? And it, it's a it's a continual process of really trying to understand how each discipline is being evaluated. Like PMs are evaluated on shipping features. So if their, their feature gets cut, then you know they get a bad review. That was the old way of thinking. But actually sometimes cutting a feature is the most important thing that you should do because you should definitely cut features that people don't need or features that are broken that don't actually work very well or that cause more confusion or make people think that your product is worse. Yeah. So I think that it's a it's an evolving process and it really just involves being curious about the other disciplines, looking at and talking to them about what their goals are and that that's what their personal goals are, right? Like how they're being evaluated for their work and how you can help support them by having this uber vision of like, okay, we're going to build this thing for, for our customers and that's going to be good because we're working together with that same vision. Amazing. Um, Josh, and that, uh, and, and that leads us quite nicely into our, our panel discussion, I think. Um, uh, and we, we have another question here from Lu Luan, um, but we will hold, we'll hold that for maybe for the, uh, the discussion. Uh, we can all kind of touch in on that a bit later in the, in the afternoon, uh, evening, wherever you're joining us from. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, yeah, I will turn off your slides. We'll switch the cameras. And I'd love to introduce uh, Paola Miani, who's a design culture lead over at uh, Lloyd's Banking Group. Hey, Paola, how are you doing? Hello. Hello. Nice to welcome you this evening. Uh, and you're going to be hosting our panel this evening. So I wonder if you wanted to kind of give us a, a very, um, and obviously Josh is going to be joining us too, uh, a quick overview of kind of, of, what, the, what, the, kind of what the panel will, will, will aim to achieve or discuss. Yeah, no, uh, well, we, we all have discussed a little bit uh, what's the best approach for, for this panel. And we, the intention of uh, having this discussion is to help the audience to understand, to make the design culture a little bit more tangible for them to be able to um, bring it to life for them and maybe discuss uh, what are the challenges, how to go about it, and share some tips and, and tricks that we have uh, test during our journeys on, on uh, embedding design cultures uh, in our organizations. Awesome. Um, amazing, Paula. Um, and obviously, uh, Josh has already introduced himself for his own talk. Uh, but perhaps you want to uh, take the reins and introduce yourself and then our, our panelists as well for the evening. Yes, sure. So, uh, yeah, my name is Paula Miani. Uh, I'm working at Lloyd's Banking Group as the head of design culture. Uh, it's a role that was created two years ago, and uh, before I was the uh, head of design strategy. But my experience has been very much in UX and customer experience. Um, um, I have been doing this for over 20 years. Um, I'm originally, um, my background is visual design, um, but I, uh, I love the uh, creating that uh, sweet spot between what the business want and what the customer want. And that's why um, I was interested in learning about marketing as well and how design is used to, to um, help the business to achieve their goals. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, in a nutshell uh, where I am today. And, uh, yeah, I would like to invite the, um, the other participants in the panel. Uh, could you please join us, Genevieve and Eric? Hello. Hi, great to have you here. I'm very Hi. Hi. I'm very excited to have you all. And um, thank you for, for inviting me. I think we, we all have a lot to share and we will try to be um, you know as, as useful as uh, as we can be for the audience. And uh, please get involved, ask questions. We will uh, get in and started uh, with um, Sort of like a, an overview of what we understand about uh, the meaning of design culture, and then um, we will take some time for for Q and A. So, Josh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's a it's a great uh, introduction of you know lo lots of things that you have talked about uh, on, on how you uh, have been approaching 
uh, creating the design culture. Could you summarize it for us um, as well, just because we're all gonna, gonna, gonna mention what mm -hmm. design culture is for you? So I think for me, design culture is the way that we come together, the way that we agree upon how to measure product truth, how we make decisions, and how we interact with each other on the team. Thank you. Um, Eric, would you like to sort of introduce yourself a little bit and, and then tell us what you think design culture is? Absolutely. Um, first, thank you for everyone for um, having me today, Paula, the rest of the panel. Josh, I thought your talk was amazing. Um, so it's really, I'm excited to be here. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. Um, so my background, uh, like yours, Paula, uh, is from multimedia and, and sort of visual design. Uh, I spent a lot of time early in my career um, doing what folks at the time were calling applied arts research. So I was working in a research center as a technical director, trying to translate these problems uh, of like public health and um, larger um, uh, sort of um, community-wide issues to the public using art. And I found myself talking a lot with developers. Um, and as time went on, we did things like working with, um, you know, uh, curating museum kiosk displays. And I became very interested and just sort of, um, uh, um, excited about how to refine my craft of, of collaborating with someone who had a different language than me. Um, and so it was really interesting over, you know, the seven or eight years that I was there um, doing a bunch of different projects and having always how, you know, finding a way to rediscover that connection. Anyway, um, that sort of led me into the field of, of UX that I'm in now. So I sort of have a very um, uh, patchwork background in terms of uh, the diverse experiences that led me up till now. Um, in terms of uh, design culture, you know, I again, I loved Josh's talk. I think that um, you know, it does depend on the lens you use somewhat. Um, mm -hmm. You know, casually people talk about things like user-centered culture and uh, design thinking, sort of interchangeably. Um, and I think in a in a casual sense that it is totally fine because I think most of the time we kind of intuit what the other person means. Um, I do, uh, looking back on my career, like a, a somewhat broader uh, vision of that. Um, because you know, design culture is like any other, and um, in that there's there, it's a shared mode of communication um, mm -hmm. of norm for a group, right? And so, you know, how designers, um, you know, usually what people mean by that is, 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 or at least within our group, is how us as designers, or we as designers, excuse me, uh, talk to others about our job, right? What it is that we, you know, do every day. Um, but when you're talking about culture, um, I personally don't like to silo that. So, like, very much like Josh's uh, vision, you know, culture is that cultivated means of establishing connections with others, right? We got to do it on purpose. We got to find mm -hmm. those ways to connect. And we all do this. We all do this all the time. We're all people doing this nonstop. And so what's unique to me about experienced designers and researchers is that we are in the business of, um, you know, trying to provide meaning for those groups and sort of see, um, you know, uh, how those those folks in those communities motivate themselves toward their goals, right? And that's whether or not it's the end users or to Josh's point, people on our own teams. So design culture to me um, are the human centered connections that are purposefully cultivated uh, to meet a shared goal or objective. And, and that's whether or not it's a product, a process, um, or just an alignment of needs through communication. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Genevieve, can you do sure. something? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Paula, for having me here tonight. And Josh, fantastic presentation. I'm really interested in that research speed dating, and I'm going to pick your brains on it later because it sounds <laughs> fascinating. Um, so I have also had quite a varied path um, throughout my career. I started off uh, as a teenager building websites and used to annoy all of my clients because I would ask, who are we building this for again and why? And I think I'm um, showing my age, but that was, what, 20 years ago that I started doing that. And, um, yeah, so that, that began my fascination with UX. And along the way, I picked up a PhD in behavioural psychology and used to run a research lab back in Australia uh, looking at emotional resilience and how we apply um, 
I guess some of the principles of behavioural economics and coping to the everyday sorts of challenges that we face. Um, and alongside that, I ran a strategic consultancy in digital marketing and UX. So it, it seemed a natural sort of nexus for my career when I when I exited academia to be looking at ways that I could apply that same behavioural psychology focus and behave, lens of behavioural economics to the sorts of problems that, that customers and um, not just customers, but society generally faces into within the digital space. Um, so it was a bit of a marriage of passions, really. Um, and I have set up a number of different businesses across a couple of different continents. So you can hear not from not from the UK originally. Um, so I ran a consultancy in Australia and used to work with a variety of clients at so Fortune 500 um, across loads of different industries, infrastructure, public sector, banking, um, you name it, I've probably done something in that space. Um, and then made the move to London. And I've, I've set up a consultancy over here, which again specialises in the application of behavioural psychology to UX challenges. Um, and at the moment, I'm contracting with Sainsbury's as their principal user research, helping to establish the research function within the broader um, digital space and within the design team. Um, and lucky enough to be working with a wonderful group of people to make that happen. Yeah. What is design culture for you? I think it's really interesting because it's there's some consensus already that's starting to emerge from from Josh and Eric, and I'm, I'm going to continue that trend, which is around it being um, about the way in which we communicate and the way in which we collaborate with people. And for me, I think design culture could probably be summed up in, in one phrase, and that's shared ownership of... The, the space that we're creating. It's like carving out a space where everyone can collaborate around a central problem, um, which moves people out of this perception that, that different teams are the out group. You know, we, uh, we have this um, propensity to separate people um, into either our in-group or out-group, and it's a bias that's really common within social psychology, but it also means that we then favour people within our in-group and we kind of push people in the out-group we literally push them out and it's how we allocate our resources, it's how we allocate our time. So I think one of the key things for me around establishing um, a kind of really vibrant and successful user-centred design culture is around encouraging the space where we're getting rid of that arbitrary differentiation and the, this arbitrary kind of creation of an outgroup and we're actually allowing a space to emerge where everybody can rally around a central thing where everybody's opinion is respected and it's by creating that that position of respect for everybody um, that we can start to take shared ownership of these problems and um, if we uh, your pyramid's a great uh, a great one josh if we can show that we understand the, the technical constraints and that we're aware of those if we can show we understand the business needs if we can also show that um, obviously the user needs to play into that, it, it's about that collaborative space. And I think from there, um, the ability to construct solutions which really work to target user needs um, and to bring other people along on the journey uh, can really take shape. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I love all, all the definitions. And as you said, we're coming sort of towards uh, a, a common sort of view of, or mm. uh, perspective on, on what that is. Uh, personally, for me, uh, it's, it's similar. It's, uh, I would say, a different way to explain the same thing. But mm. my, my take on that is um, even before um, coming into behaviors, uh, we think about um, uh, the mindsets and how uh, how people interact with each other, how people uh, understand each other, how people um, work together, and also manage their um, you know fear of failure and, and um, understanding solutions. So it's very much the, the the design thinking approach where you know you you start with the mindsets of empathizing with humans, you know, mm -hmm. only, not only your customers but your colleagues and your teams. Um, and and uh, collaborate and respect, as you said, all, all uh, subject matter experts, all different perspectives, that uh, unique perspective that each discipline can bring to create something unique and, and sort of collaborate in that shared vision. Um, so, yeah, it's um, 
design, design code, uh, at least how we're taking it at Lloyd's, uh, um, for instance, is, is about uh, not, not um, necessarily saying, you know, is the design team trying to uh, uh, be design-led. It's more how we all collaborate to be human-centered, to be mm -hmm. human-centered, whether we're designing for colleagues or for customers. Um, and and also how we break those barriers of uh, fear of failure, of uh, jumping into a, a solution without understanding the problem. Because when we start with that, then it's easier for, for example, we have more than 300 designers in our team. If, if they are able to collaborate with people that understand that, that uh, approach, then they can add a lot of value, whereas you, otherwise they will have a lot of barriers on, on their approach and they will uh, struggle. So, so that comes from how they uh, interact with their teams. As you said, everything starts with ourselves and how we, what we do and active, actively how we think about uh, other people and, and get the, the best out of working together. Um, but, but also is uh, uh, how uh, the whole organization move into a perspective of, um, you know, uh, an analyzing, understanding what is the challenge, what is behind it, and and then thinking together what 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 the priorities are and, and how to jump on. on mm -hmm. So yeah, very very similar. So, yes, Josh. Yeah, I want to uh, highlight. Uh some of some these themes that are coming up uh, because I, I totally agree. And I also want to say thank you <laughs> to Eric and uh, Genevieve uh, for agreeing with me. I, I wanted to, <laughs> there are a couple of things. <laughs> of course. You can hire us. You can hire us. What I thought was really interesting, um, something that Genevieve said about the in-group and the out-group. And I think that what's, what's really important uh, when you're working with a team of people and especially if that's a really diverse team of people that are maybe not all like you, maybe they are from other countries. And I know I, I felt really uh, a nice, a wonderful opportunity at Microsoft to be working with people from lots of different countries all the time. And I just, I know that those, those places where I could see the people that were kind of pushed out and I could also try to reach out to them. And uh, to, to Eric's point, I think that actually one of my favorite people, like, uh, or my favorite disciplines to work with are de developers. And it's because they're really creative in thinking about how to solve problems. And you just have to kind of give them a little bit of the tools of research to say like, here's some things that we know, what do you think? And they come up with such brilliant ideas and the collaboration that can happen between design and development is just so powerful that if you're in the UX bubble of like, we're this UX team, it's really easy to be like, okay, anyone else that's not UX is the out group. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start bringing them in, then you really see the power that the other disciplines can bring to the table. I, I just want to chime in on that and, and say I totally agree. I, I feel like there's always um, a danger or risk in trying to be more explicit or specific with our language that we sort of mm -hmm. um, inherently you know, build another barrier, right? So when we talk about like, um, you know, inclusive design, and I know that's a topic that we could, you know, all probably chat about um, for at length, but just <laughs> that idea of labeling it, you know, inclusive design, um, or the other the other example that, that comes to mind are all of the um, uh, operations terms. So we have DevOps, and now we have design ops, and we have research ops. And I always joke, it, it should just be ops ops, right? Because what we're talking about is being better at operations, right? So we should, so it, the, the takeaway from that is we should care about how operationally we get our jobs mm -hmm. done and how we work together. Um, we should practice inclusive design, but we should also just be inclusive in our mindset, in our approach to other people, right? So um, we should be empathetic with our, our users, but we should also just be empathetic people, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think when we're talking about culture, you have to try to you know get to um, those those values that people we want to cultivate and share, and those are things like what I just mentioned. You know, being empathetic, being inclusive. Those are things that build strong team bonds and allow folks, you know, uh, to your point, Genevieve, to to rally around a goal. Humans are really good at that when we have shared values. And so sometimes, even when I'm working on new projects or new teams, if I push to do a product vision workshop, even if product isn't right. <laughs> I know that by sitting people in a room to say, we're gonna talk about what we want this to be. 
that we will we will ine inevitably crash into misconceptions and misperceptions and that that process of aligning on the value of what we're doing is going to just grease the skids for everything else yeah. um so amazing um it just eric everything you just said made me think about a practice that we've been implementing a bit at sainsbury's which is about UXing the process across multiple different tiers. So the first thing is know yourself. Like what is it that motivates us, especially if you're trying to embed a design culture in an organization that has different levels of operational maturity or organizational maturity about with the UX process. Mm -hmm. Understanding what conditions that we work best in and how we can manage our own energy and make sure we're engaging people is really important because that allows us to then understand what biases we're bringing to it and understanding and being aware of our own blind spots or being exposed to our own blind spots means we can at least acknowledge them and then park them. But that then means that we can go to the next tier, which is how do you UX the, the collaboration space? And it's understanding what jobs our stakeholders are trying to do. And if we think about not just stakeholders, but all of the people that we're working with, what are they trying to do? What motivates them? What's important to them? What do they value? What does success look like for them? Because it's only by that level of understanding of them and their context that we can actually start to be empathetic towards them and value and respect them. And speaking to, to both of your thoughts around making sure that we, we speak the same language, it's only by understanding those motivations and what we are all bringing to the table that we can start to start to get that communal language um, that we can then use as a frame of reference to move forward from. Yeah, I just want to highlight, uh, Genevieve, thank you very much. And I think, I think uh, you know, for the audience, it would be great to, to, uh, to write that down. The first, the first step on developing a design culture is, apart from understanding ourselves, is to understand our team and use yeah. the design approach to, to do that, to create that environment. And that, that encapsulates a lot of what design culture is. It's yeah. how you um, in, uh, facilitate conversations, how you enable collaboration, how you help people to understand each other, to extract all these uh, amazing uh, you know, knowledge and experience that everybody can bring and uh, different perspectives together. Mm -hmm. To facilitate that, uh, it's, it's one of the key the key skills to to uh, develop as designers if we want to develop uh, a design culture in the organization. Mm. Uh, do you have a, anything to add, Eric? Josh? Yeah, that? I just wanted to say, um, you know, in, in thinking about this, is one of the things that I love about this field, right? Is because, and you know, Genevieve, you were you were mentioning this um, in terms of the sectors that you've worked in, right? And I think, you know, we we strive for our teams to understand them as people, right? That's what we need to do to sort of uh, build those kind of connections to achieve a goal. And what I like about that is that you can really go anywhere as long as there are people there and there are people everywhere like you can really find a community of interest to sort of um, get to know and and sort of see what their motivations are and it's one of the things that i love most about this field you know having worked in like uh higher education and worked in the public sector and now back in the private sector and doing agency versus enterprise internal i mean it's like there are always people there that have challenges that you can sort of find puzzles to solve. And I think it's, you know, for people looking to build design cultures and be sort of that, you know, you know, uh, an ambassador for this way of thinking, there's a lot of room out there to grow. And it's just one of the things I wanted to chime in on because it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. it is yeah, I, I want to add too, I think that a, a big part of it is just like, I love this idea of like, start with yourself mm -hmm. and then work out from there. And I think that the empathy piece like is one of the most important because if you care about the people on your team and you care about them succeeding and then you realize that you helping them is actually helping everyone yeah. succeed together, mm -hmm. it's really easy to get behind that because then you're all on the same page. It's like, yeah, we're all going to succeed because we're going to do this together because we're going to contribute in the best way that we know how. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. it's... Um, it's about recognizing as well that everyone has this unique super skill that they can bring to the table and creating a space where you acknowledge that. And one thing that's really worked over the years or I've observed is if you ascribe the best of intentions to people, they usually live up to your expectations. 
Like we're not ever just, you know, binary. We're not ever just one thing or another. We're not ever motivated just by one force. There's usually always multiple things going on for each person. And it's what we give voice to and what we create the space for and what we encourage in how we actively listen to the people we work with that can really change the tone of the entire project team. And by getting behind that and choosing to reframe difficult um behaviors so people are not necessarily stubborn they're tenacious so how can we <laughs> channel that in a positive way um, if people are solution focused it's because they're passionate about trying to do something right for the business and the customer so again ascribing the best of intentions while being aware that there might be other things going on for people at the same time creating a space where they can live up to that positive expectation I, i've found is really powerful I, I totally agree. And just, just to add to that, the, one of the key metrics of success for me at, a, at building a sort of a, a, a UX team, it was the first time the, the company mm -hmm. had brought UX internally and we were doing all of this foundational cultural work up front. Um, and I completely agree with your point there about uh, allowing people to um, live up to sort of those um, best of intentions that we have for them or, or expect from them. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that when I did that with my team, which was sort of rapidly growing, I, as a key metric for me was, you know, we had established a really sort of democratic process of sort of like debate and to sort of talk around how we meet the research findings with a, a design solution. Mm -hmm. And I started to notice that we were doing really well when the group started outvoting me. <laughs> we, started saying, we really value your opinion, but the research, we think this is the best solution for that. So we're gonna try that. And when I let go of that, right, mm -hmm. and just let the team sort of, you know, drive the solutions. I mean, it wasn't about it being mine or, you know, Mark's or Kent's or whoever was giving the presentation that day because we, we led with that, you know, assuming of positive intent. Um, mm -hmm. And when there were errors, we fixed them, mm -hmm. right? It really builds that engagement cycle, whether they're internally on your design team or developers. Um, because mm -hmm. I found, as I think someone else mentioned earlier, a lot of the best engagement tactics for me in, in sort of getting um, buy-in from folks have been social, right? Mm -hmm. They've been social ways to engage because that builds that trust before you enter the professional sphere of saying, I might professionally disagree with you or um, you know, have some sort of more contentious debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So I want, to, I want to stop and reflect a little bit uh, for the audience as well on what we, we just said. So. Uh, there is a big point about empathizing with people and creating that, that environment to uh, to let the team work together. Mm -hmm. uh, but also something that, that you mentioned, Eric, is let go of taking ownership of the mm -hmm. whole thing. It, you, we are enablers of the process. We're enablers of, of, of the team to succeed together. And I think that has been a huge shift in the last few years for, for a designer uh, as a discipline. So we, we were used, especially if we work in agencies, to sort of uh, understand the requirements and then bring back the solution and, and uh, sort of feel that we are the experts and we need to uh, sort of, we, we sort of uh, need to prove that and sort of demonstrate that we know what is the final answer. Now it's more about how we facilitate a conversation, how we enable people to, to do that and get the best out of that collaboration. Mm. Uh, that's great, great points to, to highlight, definitely. Yeah, I was just um, going to touch back in on what you both mentioned around letting go. And it's I think it's by doing that that you actually do create and by allowing for that shared ownership of ideas that you also foster a culture where it's okay to make mistakes and be wrong. Because if one person is not responsible, you've got distributed responsibility across a whole team. It's a lot easier for people to then <laughs> say, to try new things. If people are less worried about being critiqued personally because the idea comes from them, if it's about this space of shared ownership, you're actually taking ego out of it. You're taking all of these other things out of the process, which allows for a much more creative, um, playful, inquisitive space. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to echo that too. I think that it's um, it's a space that can feel really difficult at first because being vulnerable is really hard. Mm -hmm. And especially being vulnerable at work where you're being evaluated and you feel like I can't make a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that now having my own company and working really hard on creating the research culture and UX user-centered culture that we have in my company, one of our, our values is really around celebrating process breakdowns or mistakes as opportunities 
And we found ways to be like, yay, this is exciting that this happened when something like goes wrong or like falls out, apart. Mm -hmm. Like it and it happens. And the thing is that when you when you're like, okay, how can we fix this? How can we like improve things so that it works better in the future? All of a sudden, the you I could see the shift happening because people weren't ready for that that yay it's it was like oh no what are we gonna do and you could just see it, it in their faces and all of a sudden it was like i got another one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's almost like uh, you know as i said we start with ourselves and mm -hmm. how we react to things and then in some way that gives some example to people on on behaviors and it's not necessarily be, be written but it's demonstrated and that's how it's, it's so important to have role models and mm. especially leadership uh, giving that sort of uh, perspective to people and, and that freedom mm. so that's really good um i'm thinking um what about the challenges so we're, we're we're talking about you know all these all the things that we need to do but um can you tell us a and a story of you know how you overcome a challenge to do the things that we were talking about I'm sorry, can you ask the question again? It just cut out really quick. Sure. Uh, we were saying, you know, we, we've been talking about what we need to do, and it would be great to bring it to life with an example of, you know, uh, what challenges did you face to do mm -hmm. these things that we're talking about, uh, maybe telling us a, a story about it, and how you overcome it. I mean, I, I told a couple stories on this already. Um, Erica or Genevieve, if you want to jump in if you have one in mind. Sure. Yeah. Are oh, you going to go Genevieve? Genevieve yeah. yeah, sure. I think one of the biggest challenges that I often see in the beginning stages of trying to embed user-centered culture within design culture, within project teams, not necessarily a whole organization, but within cross-functional teams is around, uh, I guess it segues from our, our previous discussion, but it's around the tolerance of ambiguity. Um, and creating this, again, allowing and creating this space where it's okay to not have the answers and to not know exactly what we're doing. And it's about trying to create a trust in the process. So how, I mean, we have this really massive, vague, foggy, fuzzy area. We have no idea what the right thing to build is. We don't, might not even know who our customers are yet. How do we get from that to something tangible that actually lands in market? And that's that's a big leap of faith to ask people, uh, to take people on that journey with you. And I think one of the biggest challenges that I've faced in my career is about how to how to win that trust and win people over to give you and buy yourself some time to be able to work on the bigger questions, which might be transformational, but also to, to deliver, acknowledging that your product teams are under pressure to deliver features. So how do you get that balance right. And that's that's been a big challenge. It's, it's getting the balance between and understanding the tension between delivery for your product managers and product team and giving them something so they understand and you can win some trust and then asking for the space to work on the bigger questions. And one thing we've done a lot of has been a kind of dual tracking process where we, we ask, okay, what is a kind of defined, a, a fairly defined slice of the, the research question that we could ask. How do we slice that off in a way that we can show results on a very defined um, part of the problem? So it might be, for instance, you're trying to embed um, a new fulfillment method, or you might be trying to make changes to the checkout flow. Or, and you can usually, because it's a defined and concrete part of the process and there's evaluative, it's more evaluative than discovery, you can start off with that and sh show and demonstrate your process with a defined scope and on a defined problem to demonstrate the value of research, but then also to demonstrate the value of what questions are still not answered um, and to show that you're understanding where your, your teams are coming from. While you're doing that, you're also then recognising that you need to unblock the development team so they also feel engaged and bring them in on the process as well. Ask them... Um, or create a space for them to contribute to the sorts of questions or hypotheses you might want to test on this defined scope because it's usually a little less difficult to get your head around and it's a lot easier to, de to generate testable hypotheses when you already have some concrete parameters in place. Once you've done that, 
you can then start to kind of leverage outwards into the bigger questions and into saying, okay, well, while the dev team has got the answers to this piece and they're working on this, how about we come together as a working group and then start working on these, these broader questions? And I guess when you're, you're, you're using a kind of process where you start with something more contained and then you remove the constraints, and then when you're removing the constraints and removing the parameters, you're sort of teaching people how to tolerate a more ambiguous space. And I, I think that's something that's worked for me in the past, but I'd love to hear um, Erica, Josh, Paolo, if that's worked for you or if you've ever done anything similar. Sure, Josh, I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I've definitely dealt with that particular thing quite a lot, um, especially in this in the context of research speed dating where I was you know, working with non-researchers to conduct research. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I think that it's it's easy, well, the strategy that I used was to differentiate, okay, these are big questions that we're not yeah. gonna be able to address in 20 minutes, but this one seems to be the most important one to you. And so we, mm -hmm. we kind of like interview them a little bit about what they wanted to learn and kind of craft it into, okay, let's do this type of study because we did a mix of like usability, interview, paper prototyping, like, you know, anything that we could fit in 20 minutes. And so it, depending on what it was, it sounds like this is the most important. This is a, a chunk that can make sense and that you can learn with 10 people in one day and know exactly what to do next. And I think that that part of the, the process is giving people those experiences where they can learn that and go, oh, wow, I think I know pretty well what we need to do. And they get them bought into the bigger, more difficult questions that you do later with like the you know week long study or the exactly. ethnography or something. Exactly. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that um, a tolerance for ambiguity and, and my background is not is not research. I'm coming from an arts background. So the tolerance for ambiguity is quite high there. Um, <laughs> that, um, um, you know, honestly, folks outside of that sphere are not um, as accustomed to talking about ambiguity or being okay with it, to your point, uh, mm -hmm. Genevieve. I definitely think sort of having a framework for making them, you know, feel comfortable in, in sort of manageable steps makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, because I'm a mark maker, I like to to craft and draw and, mm -hmm. and see what reaction I get with the materials. You know, I am, I'm very sort of practical on my approach to these uh, challenges. I'm always trying to get to the, to the action we're gonna take tomorrow to make mm -hmm. people feel more engaged. Like what are we gonna actually do to make that person feel like we are considering their opinion? And so um, I mentioned earlier, you know, um, at least things that have worked for me um, has been the, you know, trying to find um, ways to solve the problem of who your audience is. Mm -hmm. um, because in large teams or even in small companies, you know, mm -hmm. we're very concerned with our end users, but there's plenty of other people that can affect how well you can do your job that can end up being blockers for you. Um, mm -hmm. Some of those people might just be mean, we don't know. But a lot of the times it's miscommunication and not understanding what motivates that person. Um, and if you can find that, uh, then you can sort of have a way to sort of build a strategy around deepening their engagement with your team and asking some of those big questions. So for me, in a prior engagement where I was getting a lot of pushback, and I think I think a lot of folks that come to these meetups are in those positions where maybe there isn't a mature design culture um, in their organization, and they're they're hitting some of these challenges of a you know engineering led uh, business where the, the, the senior architect is basically the end all be all. And I was in that position several years ago. Um, the, the the architect wanted nothing to do with me. The only thing he wanted for me was acceptance criteria in JIRA, that's it. And it was really sort of poisoning the well with a lot of the other developers because he was setting a, to a tone in that culture of devaluing the team I was trying to build. And mm -hmm. so when I realized um, you know, that that wasn't working, I engage socially, um, and I, I remember mentioning this to both of you in a, in a prior chat we had about this, but we stayed late at work one night and we reorganized our design studio to have more of a studio feel, an open feel. We left the door open all the time. We put coffee makers in the room. We had couches that we sort of snuck in. And in fact, some of the tables that we put in that studio, we actually had to disassemble because they couldn't fit through the door. And that let us know that no one was ever gonna stay there late at night to take them out because they would have had to actually disassemble the tables like we did. All of this to say, we created an environment to where people felt comfortable, where they mm -hmm. wanted to borrow a Keurig cup of coffee. And when we had them there, we could get to know them a little bit. 
And it was through things, uh, engagements like that, that let me realize, oh, well, that delivery manager has known that program manager for 20 years. And they've been working together for I don't know how long on many, many projects. It's a very deep well of trust there, mm -hmm. which meant that I couldn't come in and just say, because HCD says this or because UX is this, we were going to overturn that culture. So we really had to go for a bottom up strategy. And it worked. We had we had development teams um, that started coming to what we first sort of um, just started slated as lunch chats. Um, and that turned into a real capacity allocation of up to four hours a sprint dedicated to those developers coming, seeing the research sessions, um, helping us with design. You know, the best thing you can do to engage uh, a developer is give them the marker and send them up to the whiteboard. Let them let them craft their vision because I think it does two things. It allows them to be heard, but it also, if they're not used to communicating that way, I do think they develop a understanding of the craft that we all spend our time cultivating as well, to being, to being able to articulate design decisions and why we wanna move one direction over another. Anyway, for me, a lot of those practical applications came through a social lens. Um, and I encourage, you know, as you as you made at the end of your talk, Josh, you know, everyone is on one of these teams and how you engage with your other your teammates is the best place to start. And often that's with a, a social approach. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's great. Uh, great, great approach. And thank you for, for sharing. Um, I think uh, um, just to sort of summarize a, a bit the the key challenge is to build trust, to gain trust, and it's all about building relationships and actively listen to people when really, you know, get them involved and hear what they have, uh, what they're thinking, what is in their heads, what, uh, uh, and really try to understand where they're coming from, as you know, know your audience and your mm -hmm. audience can be your stakeholders, not, not just the customers. Um, and, and sort of uh, when you, when you, uh, in any relationship, you demonstrate that you are listening, people feel heard, people feel valued, people feel respected. Mm -hmm. and, and if you come with a, with a good uh, intention and with intention for help, you start by sharing and explaining how your skills um, can help these people. Now, now that you understand them, it's more about help them to, to win. And by mm -hmm. them winning, you, you're also winning because they will call you to sit in the table, they, they will know that you can be useful, that you can be helpful, and they will uh, value your opinion and, and respect you as well. So it all comes from us uh, again. Mm -hmm. It's always how we are the changes and, and how we actually respect them and listen to people. Mm -hmm. um, have, you, uh, um, have you come up with a challenge in relation to um, how to marry business goals and user goals? Um, and it, it's also in the, in the question, uh, yeah. Uh, from the from the participants or the audience, sorry. Um, anything to mention about that that you want to share? I think this taps into a principle that kind of guides how I try and operate um, across many businesses, which is slow down to speed up. It's not my phrase, but it um, it seems appropriate. And one of the key things is to take the time at the beginning to understand because sometimes. Like with users, if you ask them what they actually want, they'll give you a list 30 items long, but it doesn't mean they're all the most essential um, or they're all actually, they're all things that are going to be used. It's the same in a lot of ways with business goals and with metrics. And you ask people what they want from a business perspective, and often the list is 30 items long <laughs> as well. Um, so I think one of the biggest lessons for me over the past uh, five years or so has been understanding up front what are the non-negotiables and how does that particular goal map onto the wider organisational goals as well? So understanding the context of this specific ask from the business, understanding how that maps onto the organisation and understanding why, because sometimes it will be, a, okay, we want this thing to increase in participation by X amount. But if we don't ask the why behind it, is it because you want to retain that customer? Is it because you're looking to try and help them channel switch? Is it because you're trying to acquire new customers by setting up a USP in the market around this particular product? Again, asking why with those goals, understanding what the non-negotiables are and what success would look like if you disentangle an arbitrary metric really helps to then understand what you're aiming to, uh, what you're sort of shooting towards um, and how you're 
how you can keep that in mind as you start framing the, the questions that you might want to put to your users as well. Uh, you wanted to say something good? Yeah, I think um, I totally agree with that. And I think that what I've found is that as this was, so PMs and data scientists are really good at like breaking things down into lots of little pieces and trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you have to kind of bubble them up into like, okay, well, what does this metric mean? Mm -hmm. And I think with all of them, we, and we measured so many of them, but it was really like, what really matters is people are using our product, they're spending time using our product, and then mm -hmm. that turns into 50 things. Like they clicked here, they spent time here, they went to this, they logged in X number of times per whatever period, right? And so it's kind of like, okay, well, we just wanna get the people that use it to use it more. We mm -hmm. want to get more people to use it. And we wanna make the people that are using it not angry by changing something. And so, it, and, and this is I've also kind of a, noticed another kind of funny thing here, because I think like, um, so my background is actually music composition and English poetry. And so I think more like an artist designer, but yet I do research. And so I'm kind of in this weird space where I feel like I think like a designer, but then my research brain kind of like takes over and I'm like, well, we have to make these numbers like make sense. And I want to like make them nice and perfect in, in the two by two. and. Uh, I pull it all together, but then I, I I have this way of just trying to pull back up and okay, what's going on here? We just want to get more people. We have 50 ways of looking at like measuring these things, but here's like I mean, people are using it. They want to use it. I I think that that hits on the point of the the role that um, sort of narrative and story plays in communicating the value of design because I think both of you are 100,000 billion percent right. <laughs> Everybody has all the little charts and things and they want to yeah. see them. But rarely, in, in my experience, in my career, does someone have a focused vision that they uh, still agree with or that they've even done? Um, because I think there's a commitment there that is challenging for people, frankly, emotionally, to reflect and say, this is what we're about, right? And to say, we're not going to be everything. This is what we're going to focus on because this is what we value. And I think that's really just hard for people to do in general, right? I mean, people in their personal lives find it hard to develop a sense of direction and motivation on what they want to do because there's a lot of responsibility to say those things to yourself. It's not any different with a business when you have millions of dollars on the line and many, many, many people sort of depending on uh, the product continuing to improve and perform well. So I don't think it can be understated at all. Like, you know, I love the way that you um, uh, sort of put that, Josh, in terms of how, you know, let's, let's break down the work work, but let's make sure when reassembled, it builds up into a vision or a narrative for why we're doing all of this. And so I'm always doing things like with my designers, with whatever, no matter how small the project is that they're working on, I say, if you can't tell someone exactly why you're doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. right, in like a minute or in, you know, I have a million dollars in my hand, just tell me what you're doing. <laughs> so I don't give you this million dollars. Um, because it, it gets back to how we communicate, especially that that purpose and that narrative that really drives a lot of the other cultures that we see in our organizations. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. I think Genevieve, you had a story about that as well. Uh, yeah, less a story and more just um, a takeaway. Like, yeah. I completely agree with what you've both said. I, I also think one of the really important things to remember is as designers, um, and as you know, UX specialists, we do really care about the end users. Um, but it's really important as well to pick our battles. <laughs> there are some <laughs> things that are going to make a really big difference if they don't land right for a user. And there are some things that are not going to have as catastrophic an impact. Um, and when you're dealing with teams, there has to be some flexibility and give and take, you know. Um, and I think understand what you need to fight for and why and what and understanding what you can be a little bit more relaxed on from a user's perspective and if it's not going to cause the, the catastrophe um, and there's a very solid business reason relaxing the reins a little bit on that and being flexible is really important to buy in trust and to be seen as someone you can actually a team or a person you can actually work with it's it's yeah it's just that reciprocal give and take, really. Um, and if you give a bit, then you you <laughs> you have a bit of goodwill in the bank for when things are catastrophic if we don't prioritise the users. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 
I learned about that as well um, yeah. um, a while ago that uh, when you're so passionate about the customer and all the things that you have learned and research and you're saying no it's not in this direction it's in that yeah. and, and you're sort of fighting trying to help them to see what you can see um, and yeah. Uh, you lose them because they mm. have their own mindset. They all have the, the reasons why they're making those other decisions. And mm. if you don't sort of understand that from their perspective and, and, and sort of um, understand where are the trade-offs in the business as well and, and understand that language and how to best uh, uh, come across with those findings. And as you said, pick your battles. Where are the things that are like non-negotiable as well mm -hmm. for, for us? It's like, this is this is I want I want this to be written. I'm against this, but I will, you know, I, I will um, sort of uh, help on on making the best the best of it because I understand that the, the, the business needs for an strategic reason or whatever to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I, so so basically, let's be you know pretty pretty customer obsessed but not too customer obsessed we can't be completely obsessed right mm -hmm. and i think i think it's a deeply practical and strategic point that uh genevieve and uh Paola, you just you know um chimed in on because you know i think talking about that strategy is something that i try to really foster in the teams that i'm on like we should just we should just really talk openly about it like what is it that we want to achieve what are our biggest priorities and we're going to go out there and fight for them but let's have a a plan for 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 the um the b option and the c option and you know I, I believe in that so much to so where we had meetings we would have half hour meetings or, or uh, you know once or twice a week that were just called strategery that's all we <laughs> did is talk about how do we want to position you know what we feel is right to push on um mm -hmm. and we would strategize you know maybe mark maybe you don't push so hard on that this week because we really feel that this is important we can't be evangelizing a thousand percent all the time um without sort of making some thoughtful concessions mm -hmm. yeah yes josh yeah exactly and i this is at that really at the heart of what i'm trying to get at when i said negotiated product truth and it's because everything that we build is a compromise and it's gonna compromise in maybe one direction more than others sometimes. But in the end, we want the, the main vision of the product to be sound. And there's a give and take, of course, and we have to be okay with that. And that's part of that is being honest, being okay with being wrong, being humble when you're like, when you had a bad idea that tested poorly, like it's, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter actually. Like what matters is that we solve the problem and we're, we're still coming together to solve that problem. Yeah, it's, 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 it's great to reflect on, on all these. Uh, in the end, it's not design skills, it's just human skills in a way. It's people like, skills. People skills, yeah, exactly. So once you know the process, once you know, you know, uh, uh, how to be human center, then as, as you said, you know, it's at the beginning. You just need to apply this uh, to, to how we connect with people, how we interact with people, and um, and uh, be more in inclusive and, and collaborate. But work on ourselves in our, uh, you know, in our way to see the world and our way to interact with people. Um, and maybe we can, um, you know, uh, I, I can't see more questions coming up, but please, please. Um, uh, ask questions we will continue work uh, talking about this a little bit more but um, mm -hmm. maybe the, um, picking up on the skills of storytelling and how we uh, communicate what what we do eric you mentioned you mentioned that a bit um what what uh what's your experience uh, on that and what would be your recommendations on, on how we talk about design and how we tell the stories um i think that uh you know, being able to to speak and uh, speak clearly and 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 have that sort of um, that coalescing narrative always on the the tip of your tongue because you learn things in research and things change. You might learn something and you have to go back. Um, so it's not that it's a, a permanent uh, narrative, but usually there's a, a large arc there um, that Josh was mentioning before that you have to sort of be continually um, asking yourself: Are we supporting this narrative or are we not? Right. Um, and so I think that uh, that is always fueled by by research. Um, I think from from again, from a, a design perspective, I, I think that we see a lot about um, uh, how to you know build customer journey maps, how to build these sort of um, 
what would feel a lot of times like static representations of a slice in time um, that um, you know um, often can feel stale as soon as you finish printing them. Um, but in terms of evangelizing those things, some of the things that we would do is, and everybody's heard this and seen this in, in blogs, but I think it's actually still quite appropriate. Um, make those things visible to folks that aren't on your team, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we we had, this is again, very simple and practical solutions here, but we no one used this giant plotter at, at this job I had once, no one used it. So, and I would ask people and they didn't know how to connect to it. It like wasn't on the network for whatever reason. <laughs> so I was like, I'm gonna use this plotter yeah. and I like burned through so much ink on that thing. And I, I just covered um, the walls and um, with either customer journeys or research insights or um, strategic objectives for our customers. So I think that there's a, a curating that has to happen with regard to knowing what your customer needs, understanding how those map onto the business needs, and then very explicitly put them together in visualizations. So mm -hmm. I got to the point where I would instead of doing our sprint maps or whatever we were doing, um, it was kind of like this uh, <laughs> Martin Luther, like uh, a, a, um, a scene in one of our PI plannings where I came in, I was like, I'm not doing any of these maps. And I like stapled this big like um, user journey to the wall. And then I, as the planning session was happening, I went around and grabbed the features that the teams were scoping for that PI. And I put them directly under one of the user needs, right? And so by the end, we left with what I call the feature map that allowed people to see, oh, what I'm working on is helping the user do this. Mm -hmm. And that took off like wildfire. Developers loved it because it gave them some purpose to what they were doing. They weren't just finishing stories in Jira. They weren't just finishing features and APIs. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's amazing. Um, but having that context for that narrative really, really helped them. So any way that you can like practically bolt those business needs to the customer needs and then disseminate it, socialize it, um, because folks really get motivated by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a related one where, so I have a, a two by two that I created around known and unknown problems and known and unknown solutions. And I would just start mapping out like, this is a problem that we don't have a solution for. And I just put it there. Okay, here's what this is. This means we're going to do this type of research to try to figure out what the best solution mm -hmm. is. Over here, that. we know what the solution is. And we know the problem and the solution is we just need to like make this as good as we can. So we're just going to do some usability studies on it to refine it, make sure that it's really good, ship it, multiple products, et cetera. And then there's that other category of like, these are solutions in search of problems. We don't really know if this is a problem or not, but it's a solution. And we're going to approach the research for that completely differently. And when I start mapping this out for people and explaining, you could see the light bulb go off and you're like, ah. Okay, and now I understand why we have to approach this differently. And there's this level of confidence that you can get in the the research insights as well as the confidence in the solution that you are building. Mm -hmm. And if you're at high confidence, like go for it and do it. But if it's like, eh, it's not really, you know, kind of low confidence, like we better get more confidence from some data type, from someone, from mm -hmm. something that's gonna support this is important enough to spend time doing. Mm -hmm. What I love about that, which you just you just mentioned there, is that it um, talking about problems in that framework, um, it sort of smuggles in the idea of not doing something as yeah. well, right? It's, and I and I love that. Um, you know, I was I remember going to the uh, Code for America summit a couple years back, and they had this. I can't remember exactly the context, but there was this team working on trying to revise um, criminal expunging criminal records um, once someone once some uh, a certain time period had gone by, and they were working on the system for years. Right, they were trying to make the system work and never really did what it was supposed to do. And when they finally like did a huge sort of research. Um, uh, and design sort of um, investigation, they realized that they just shouldn't have that system. <laughs> <laughs> and so they had spent so many years trying to have this system perfect and meet all the needs, but when the, what they really realized was that they didn't need it. And I just, mm -hmm. that just stuck with me. And so Josh, I cannot yeah. say what you just said more because it, it leaves open that idea. It's like, it's a cool feature, maybe in some universe, not sure if it's this one, right? Like. <laughs> Yeah. I have an article I'm going to put in the chat note for, for everybody because it's like it's about this exact thing. So <laughs> looking forward to reading it. In, in something that uh, we, we found uh, very challenging sometimes is that 
when uh, the business comes with, yeah, this is the problem, this is the solution, just go and do it. Mm-hmm. And think, uh, okay, what evidence do you have that this is actually a problem? And, and how do you know that this solution will work? Um, mm-hmm. So how did you find, uh, or, or any tips or tricks on, on how to manage that situation where, you know, the business know what to do and then you're like, no, hold on, what evidence do you have about that? <laughs> yeah, uh, it actually ties into something that's already been mentioned a bit as well. So it's a nice segue. That um, what happens if you don't do something? And I think I like to, and maybe it's a little dramatic, but to highlight the cataclysmic outcomes. <laughs> so it's the, okay, let's let's take run a thought experiment here. Let's build exactly that in exactly the way that you said it. What would happen if we did that without getting evidence? What is the worst case that we could come up with for that particular outcome? You build something, you invest billion, millions of pounds into something, and maybe two people use it, okay? What, what happens if we do that? There's an opportunity cost for things that we're not investing in that actually work for our customers that the other business might be. So it's kind of this marriage of... of <laughs> highlighted the cataclysm and then showing what the alternative could look like and also scaffolding people along the way. So if you then narrow that down to a specific problem or a specific product or a specific thing that they could be building, it's like, okay, this is the worst case scenario or this is the current worst case scenario because we've already built it and we've built a solution without a problem and a solution without an audience, okay? This is the best case scenario. What's the map to get there? And it's about showing that disparity um which i think has helped throughout my career in bringing people along with you on the journey because it's actually forcing people to it's forcing the articulation of things that are always bubbling away but often don't get said so it's bringing to the surface not just the assumptions and the opinions but also what the worst case could be and what the opportunity cost of, of acting or taking running off quickly in the wrong direction it's like deciding you want to go somewhere but you haven't actually decided where and you're just in the car driving for the sake of driving because there's the perception of motion what about if we slow down to speed up there's also this idea that if we have invested time and energy into it we have to keep doing it because (laughs) it was right in the past yeah, yeah. But we just we have to just the the train's going to keep moving because we got and it's like no it's actually a really well known bias called the sunk cost um, bias. yes yep and it's uh, it's why people stay in relationships a lot longer than they should as well yeah <laughs> it's a there's also, psychologist in me <laughs> yes there's also I think that an interesting piece of um, what I call tribal knowledge and mm. I remember when. I was in Outlook and there was this tribal knowledge about the the ribbon, which is the toolbar across the top of the mm-hmm. the application, which is similar as the toolbar in, in Office, so Word and Excel, PowerPoint, et cetera. And there was this research that people just kept referring to that no one could produce. It was so long ago that people just knew that this thing was true, but nobody could point to it. Nobody could find the study. And then we started doing studies on it. And um, there, I don't know if you, if you remember from like four or five years ago, the ribbon changed. Uh, that was part of the research that I was working on. And it was because we actually proved through research that people, if you reduce the number of icons on it, that people find the things that they need faster and it's easier to use. And it was like, we just had to like take people along the process. Like, okay, well, we did the study. Here's what we found. This other study, I, nobody's, nobody seems to find to know where that is, but here's what we're finding is true. And it was just kind of like slowly kept coming along and you know, yeah. we did an outlook and then all of a sudden office <laughs> went on that journey as well. So uh, I think yeah. sometimes, sometimes it's, it's that, that journey and taking people along with you to slowly dispel those tribal yeah. knowledge that, that are wrong. You, you just reminded me of something else that's really important, which is democratizing the output of the research so people can find it and having some mm. taggable repository, having a way to share the knowledge because by allowing people to go in and engage with research and the findings and the outputs, you're really opening up the possibility of having them buy in when you then go and speak to them about the next project. And it's something we've been trying to do at Sainsbury's as well within the design team to make sure that there is a place to access all of the work that we've been doing um, 
And uh, so that when you do go and kick off a new project, there are uh, recent results that you can start to, to surface and feed in. Yeah. Another thing that I love about the, that those two stories is that, you know, like maybe, maybe there was never any research there. Maybe it was a mass delusion, <laughs> right? Or maybe it never actually happened. But more, more appropriately, it probably may have been right at one time, right? Mm -hmm. To your point, Josh. And I think that- In the past. Yeah, exactly. In the past. <laughs> So like this idea of, you know, um, I, I find that there's still sort of a, a waterfall mindset that kind of creeps in. It's like, okay, thank God, the research is done. We don't ever have to do that again. It's like, no, it's actually, yeah. <laughs> so we have to continually be asking ourselves these questions, continually discovering, you know, not 24 seven, but when appropriate, when we start to see some of that slip between the narrative we've given ourselves to, to um, the goals and narratives we've given ourselves to achieve um, and whether or not we're actually realizing those outcomes. It might be time to do a refresh, to go back and do exactly what you did um, to say, is the ribbon really doing what it's supposed to be doing, <laughs> right? Question the ribbon. <laughs> Especially this year, that everything that you thought was true might not might not be, or, you know, you have to change massively this year. So, yeah, that's um, I think we're going towards the, the end of the conversation and maybe we can uh, wrap up with what would be the one tip that you will uh, sort of suggest uh, the audience to, to, to take in if they want to uh, develop this design culture. I can jump in first because I have mine at the end of my presentation. That'll give my other uh, panelists time to think about it because this is a, a hard one. Yeah. Um, but I think that my my wrap up is be team centered in your quest to solve user pro problems. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. I think it really just boils down for me to expecting the best of people and believing that we are all putting our own biases aside, believing the best of people and knowing that we are all working towards a common goal, even if it means we have to help clarify, articulate, elucidate that goal for the people we work with. But set that goal up, set that shared vision and believe the best in people. And I've not been disappointed yet. Yeah, I think I agree with everything that everyone said pretty much the entire time uh, since this has been a lovely call. I, I think, um, you know, to try to button it up, I, I would say, you know, have conversations, right? Have conversations so you can know the people that you're working with, right? Um, just, it sounds simple, but really get to know them, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you actually do kind of really kind of care if their day is going well, right? And I think, um, you know, through having those conversations, you can know, like, the, the, in the broadest definition, um, the audience and the people you're going to be working with to try to achieve what you want to do, what the business wants to do, um, what the dev teams want to do, as well as what the, the customers and users might actually need. So have conversations. Yeah, I agree with everything as well. And I will say, you know, uh, be curious, be curious, uh, uh, you know, have an enormous curiosity of what's going on, what it's important, who, you know, what matters to people, people in general, and uh, be humble and don't think that you know all the answers, don't uh, 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 feel that, you know, that, that, that you, you are the expert that you have to leave the others, you, you, you might learn a lot from other people and it's related to be curious and, and be humble. Uh, and 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 also, I think believe that change is possible. Have that mm. courage to try things and feel that you can actually make a difference. Um, and and I think it's back to what you were saying. Just is is uh, knowing yourself and knowing what you um, you know, n knowing what you uh, are able to achieve, but also knowing your limitations and ask for help. I think it's uh, uh, my recommendation for for today as well. And Miles, do you want to jump in? There you go. <laughs> hey, time to perfection. <laughs> um, hi, thank you again uh, for an awesome panel. Um, you know, uh, to the audience, please, please do take some of these insights, lots of practical tips as well, and and, and, and lots of experience here, and bring that into 
uh, sort of redefining or growing your culture within your organization in 2021. Um, so again, thank you to Josh for a great presentation to start us off. Um, and then Paula, uh, Eric, Genevieve for joining us for the panel. Uh, and of course, a special thank you to Paula for hosting it, uh, which is always a challenge. So thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've, I really felt like it was a really balanced conversation, so I, I thought you did a great job. Uh, lots of insights coming from all parties. So, um, again, um, to our audience, thank you very much for attending. And again, to our partners, uh, Sherpa, Zebra People, and to the Adobe XD team uh, for helping make this uh, possible to bring to our community. Um, so, yeah, that's all from us. Uh, again, we do have a, a final pop-up just here uh, from the Sherpa team. Um, so please do check them out uh, if, if you're interested. Uh, so thank you from all of us here this evening. Uh, good night, and we'll see you soon for our next event. Thank, thank you. you very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.